Well, thank you all for joining us today right after lunch. We'll try to promise to make it a little entertaining for you and not put you to sleep as you're digesting all your food. My name is Rhonda Buckaloo. I'm the clinic administrator with CHI St. Gabriel's Health. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about who we are first. You know, we're a small healthcare organization that sits in central Minnesota. We're comprised of, um, there we go. We're comprised of a critical access hospital, 22 beds. We have a small medical group practice, about 22 primary care, advanced care providers and physicians, and uh, 22 um, specialty general surgeons, uh, OB, things like that. And then a home care and hospice agency. And we have all of that because we are the sole health care provider in our community. Is that not working? I'm not it's quite not getting working. these to advance. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So this is where we are. Everybody always asks, where are you? We're in Little Falls, Minnesota, which is right there, that yellow star. It was negative four degrees on Tuesday morning there, so it's, uh, it's a wonder why we decided to come here to talk to all of you today, right? Right. So Morrison County, we are rural. We're a, a very small populace of less than 35,000 people. The city of Little Falls itself, which is the main city in the county, is less than 9,000. So we're very small. We are rural medicine. But we're a very insured area, so we do a really good job at enrolling our folks into our state Medicaid program. So we have a disproportionately high number of Medicaid patients um, in our community. Um, that's pretty much the bulk of the folks you're going to hear us talk about today. But that's not necessarily true, because it crosses the full spectrum of every insurance. Um, uh, it doesn't, it uh, doesn't matter who or what you are, uh, you're part of this uh, um, problem. So how did we start? You know, I started my career back in the middle 90s, and at that time I was uh, working for a day treatment, partial hospitalization, mental health uh, substance abuse clinic. And I learned very quickly that we have some issues with uh, our healthcare delivery system related to that. And, um, stigma attached to that. But I learned also the importance of a, a multidisciplinary care team and what a comprehensive care panel can do for patients um, when you're looking at a whole person care. And so that's exactly what we did in 2012 when our clinic decided we were going to change the way we deliver primary care to our community. And we started to work towards becoming a patient-centered medical home. Now, probably in 2012, that probably wasn't new news for a lot of areas, but in rural Minnesota, it certainly was big for us. It was something that hadn't been done, and we set out to try to change the way we do care. So we got a big break in 2013 when we got some cash. We got some money to get us uh, to hire some nurses and some care coordinators and start thinking about the ways we can use social workers and pharmacies in our, in our clinic setting. And that tabled, brought us right into 2014 when we were working on our opioid crisis and what are we going to do about it in our community. We said, well, this is exactly what we're trying to do in primary care. This is no different. This is an issue. So we went after some more grant money, and in 2015, we were awarded a SIM award. That award was a, a community-based award. We had to partner up with all of our community partners, because as you know, a community problem takes a community solution. So we work with our long-term care facilities, our home care agencies, our payers, our pharmacies, our law enforcement, our schools, and we all sat around the table to say, what is it we're going, we're going to do to, tap, to tackle this epidemic? So we started a, a task force. The community's task force main purpose really was around information sharing. Get us all on the same page as to what it is we need to do, what, it needs, what we need to be doing differently, created community, community, community education programs and school education programs. And then we focused on safety, you know, doing our drug take back programs, a lot of things that other communities are already doing. This wasn't anything new. But the main thing we started, oh, this is a great picture of how many folks were involved in that same grant. We actually got recognized from the um, Department of Human Services for that work, too. But the main thing we started to do and what we're going to talk to you about today is what we did in the clinic setting, which is the controlled substance care team, as we've called it. The work that we started to do in our clinic setting to take care of our folks. So we started out very simple. We got some money. We had myself as a clinic administrator, my physician partner champion, Dr. Devine, and our first RN care coordinator that we were hiring. And then we soon hired a social worker. And we said, what are we going to do? And we couldn't Google it. We couldn't see uh, you know, what's happening out there. This was a grassroots effort on our part. And we may or may not have always got it right, but we started our journey. 
I'm not sure what our weakest link might have been in the beginning, but there may or may not be truth to that picture, though we did call in reinforcements with his colleague, Dr. Heather Bell, later. So I don't know. We'll just leave it at that. Key partnerships, even when we started talking about how we take care of our patients in the clinic, was critical. We needed to know what was happening to our prescriptions when we wrote them, and they went out into our communities. So our law enforcement and our pharmacy partnerships were critical. So we started to work on this, but then we also said, we got to pay for this going into the future, and how are we going to do that? Grant money only took us so far. So we worked really hard with our payer contracts and looked at some quality incentives we could do around uh, the different care models we had. We took advantage of our patient-centered medical home certification that we were able to achieve and uh, build out our care coordination to our state Medicaid programs. We get a little bit of funding for that and a per member per month amount, but it certainly doesn't cover all the costs, but we're constantly looking at different ways to pay for the new models that we're doing. So it's a, it's a constantly evolving thing. There's no end really goal. It's uh, just always changing the way we do things. So that's, that's kind of just a high level what we're gonna talk to you about today, but our story is best told by our provider champions, those who actually did the work. So I'm gonna turn this over to Kurt. Dr. Devine, and get the story started. Okay, so Kurt. we'll, oh, I need this, don't I? It's all this technology. Uh, you know, it's interesting, I don't know if people realize this, that, but when this, when this whole thing got started, uh, for us to be in this conference, it was actually just the innovation and transformation, and when they added us to the bill here, they, they added disruption. I think that's, that's, our, uh, that's our goal. So uh, we're gonna do a couple of things. Uh, really what we do is we tell a little bit about what our program uh, has done uh, and the different programs that we're doing with our state to kind of help. Now, to be honest, how we ended up here was actually pretty interesting. We met some of the Moss Adams people when we spoke at AHA in uh, Phoenix, and uh, we want to thank Michaela Johnson, who's at the back, for asking us to come. Uh, she's very nervous because she looked at our slides, and she's not sure exactly where we're going with all of this. Uh, and so, uh, a couple things, we are not addiction doctors. Dr. Bell and I are family practice doctors. We do not, although we do a lot of addiction medicine, maybe this time next year we'll be able to say we're addiction boarded. Uh, at this time we are not. Uh, the other interesting thing about our talk is that we, we play this little game that you get to be a part of, which is there are frequently things in our talk that we don't know are gonna be there, which make it very interesting. I put things in my talk to make fun of Dr. Bell, which I really enjoy. And sometimes the, the slides will show up in hers that are pretty funny. So. Uh, We've already seen one of those slides that I'm the weak link. Uh, pretty obviously, that's uh, not true. Uh, Dr. Bell and I are <laughs> well, mostly not true. And Dr. Bell and I are, are quite different in that I'm a little bit older than she is, and my kids are already out of the house, and I have grandchildren. Uh, she is married, has a, has a number of children, although her house is quite big, and we don't know how many children she actually has there. Counting has been difficult. Uh, so there's a bunch. So we're going to kind of move through the talk. It's going to move very fast, and we're going to kind of get going. This is how Heather Bell sees my, Dr. Bell sees my career. She believes that she is pushing me into retirement, and that's apparently me in the wheelchair. Uh, and to be clear, when Dr. Bell started in our clinic, I was so concerned that she looked so young. I went to, I went to our administrator, Rhonda, and I said, my God, I said, I, I saw this new doctor coming out of a room, and she was walking down with this little old lady who needed to start exercising, and, uh, and, and Dr. Bell stops, and the lady says, well, what do you think I should do for our exercise? And Dr. Bell says, well, have you tried the monkey bars? Um, and, and that's really, she's quite a bit younger. She looks a little older now. So where did this all start? Let's talk about the emergency rooms. Emergency rooms were a big place that we were all seeing a problem. Uh, there were a lot of people going to our emergency rooms just to get pain medications. And we, we all saw that in all of our hospitals. And in fact, for us, it was the number one reason people went. Uh, it was the number one cause of death for Americans, less than 50. Very, we all know that. 50 million Americans were taking their pills, using them in a way they weren't supposed to be used, snorting them, smoking them, all those things that you can do with pills that are interesting. This slide we started using three years ago. When we spoke three years ago, we picked this slide because there were 30,000 people dying a year from overdoses. That number is now, this year, 72,000. And so we keep this in there just so people can understand that this problem has not been solved, not in the least. And if you look at where all the pills are going, of course, they are going to America. 99% of Norco, which used to be known as Vicodin, is consumed by our country. And we obviously know that we don't have more pain than everybody else. And when you add certain medications, such as the benzodiazepines, your Ativan, your Xanax, this makes the risk of death and respiratory depression much, much higher. So we, we really look at all of these different things. And benzodiazepines are frequently involved in overdose deaths, and we've seen this in our town. 
So how did this all start? We love to talk a little bit about how this all began because I think the tendency is for people to think this doctors kind of made this. And, and although we have a part in this, uh, there was a lot more going on in our country at that time. That the, why this happened? <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. Uh, I still have those glasses. Um, so in 1983 is really when it started. Uh, I know it's not. It was in 1986 this actually started. There was this Dr. Portnoy who, was, who actually wrote a letter into the pain, uh, into a, a journal that was all about pain. And he just noted that, geez, we could probably treat people with pain. And wouldn't that be a great idea if we made everybody have less pain? Sounds like a great idea. Uh, didn't work out so well. It was not long after that they had picked up steam and during the 90s we saw the American Pain Society really push to, for doctors to be treating pain. Now to be clear, they also took about $2 million from the makers of OxyContin to help do some of their research and to help them with uh, lots of other things. Uh, really that same year is when OxyContin, which was one of the most abusable medications we've ever seen, uh, came out. It was no, again, it was no coincidence that all these things were coming at the same time. Dr. James Campbell was actually the president of the American Pain Society, and in his talk, he, when he took over, he talked a little bit about how we should really be focusing on people's pain. Uh, and they weren't the only ones. Then everybody kind of fell on board. The veterans' health got on board. And to be clear, honestly, the, the veterans have been one of the big groups to really turn this around very quickly in their clinics, which has been great. That was about the same time Dr. Bell learned to drive, uh, 1986. She was 16 years old. So now, throughout the late 90s, the Pain Society started to work with the Wakers of OxyContin to tell us all how you could take OxyContin and you would not get addicted. In fact, I can remember going into a room with a drug representative who told me this very thing, that 1% of people would get addicted, he handed me these papers, uh, these two papers that they used for their data. And the interesting part about that is, of course, that these papers that they felt showed that only 1% would get addicted were actually done on in-hospital patients, patients in, one of them was actually in a burn unit, where they would give patients narcotics before they debrided them, and then when they sent them home, they checked on them to see if they ever became addicted. Uh, in fact, there were multiple studies during that time that showed boy, your risk of getting addicted to narcotics if you're on them for any period of time is probably relatively high. And so we really need to kind of stay away from these things. Uh, and they, the estimate probably closer to 30%, but this was not something that we, we knew. And in fact, if you look, this is an actual meeting from the OxyContin makers. It says, people, the facts are inescapable. How can we ignore them? And they, they continue to ignore them. Things got worse for doctors because this, the Federation of State Boards, which oversees the state boards, which oversees me having a license to, to do medicine, they started telling the states that they needed to make sure doctors were treating people's pain. And that came really from also JACO, and many of you know that JACO was involved in this, and in fact, they're involved in a lot of lawsuits surrounding this whole issue. One of their things was that patients that came to my hospital they had better be treated for their pain and they better be, uh, when they sign their little things after their discharge to tell how their care was, hospitals actually paid a little bit by whether the pain was controlled. And that's where some of the reimbursement was linked. Uh, I went to meetings over lunches, learning how to make sure patients had a zero for a pain score because that's where you were the winner. And of course, then the Federation of Medical State Boards in 2004 said they wanted the state boards to make it a, a kind of a crime for doctors not to treat pain. And this is actually the letter that I got in the mail from the State Board of Minnesota that told me in short words, you had better treat people's pain or you're gonna come down to the Twin Cities and we're gonna have a little talk with you. And I had a friend who got sucked down into that because he would not fill some of these pain medications that he didn't feel was appropriate and they reported them to the state board uh, because he wasn't treating their pain. And what happens? Well, I'm no genius, but that graph is going up. Pe more people died. Okay? And it's no accident because we had pills going all over. And the reality was we knew a lot of things about opioids at that time, and we knew that they weren't the best pain medication, that it didn't last a long time, that over a period of months and weeks, uh, your pain would be the same as when you started. And so there really was good data that it wasn't the best thing. And obviously then in 2013, we started to see overdose deaths uh, being uh, surpassing the car accidents, which is uh, really something that I think none of us really wanted to see. So what did we do in our town? I'm afraid to flip this. I never know what's going to be in there. Um, so, so what caught our attention? Well, uh, one of the things was really the refills. I'd been gone from Little Falls for four or five years, took a break, went and did something a little bit different, came back, and I, was, I would be on call, and I would be asked to fill prescriptions that were for two and three and 400 opioid pills a month for patients of my partners. 
I found that quite disturbing. Uh, and so that was very concerning. Our emergency room was flooded with these people. And in fact, we had people, the number one reason you came to our ER was because your pain pills just got ate by the cat or they flushed down your toilet or something happened to them. And so we knew that we had an issue. And then of course was the police. The police in our community had come to our clinic to talk to providers they knew were overprescribing and got no traction. Uh, as an aside, I mean, uh, you can see who we've got here. And Dr. Heather Bell, when I first showed this uh, thing, she said, you know, you'd probably get a little bit of a, a laugh if you put a picture of a famous actor who played a policeman on TV. It would be a lot more amusing. And so, of course, I've got this one for Heather. Um, we all know that show. Uh, so what caught the other, the other things that caught our attention was deaths. We were having a death every three months in our community from opioids. And so it was a, a very common thing to happen. So we decided we need to do something. And as, as Rhonda mentioned, we started this task force. And they came into my room uh, multiple times trying to get me to do this. And I was on the fast track to quit working. And, uh, and they said, oh, you should really start coming to these meetings. And I was pretty much not going to go to another meeting the rest of my life. And after the third time they came to my office, I said, I'll, I'll go to one of these meetings, but I'm not going to another one. And uh, here I am, right here. Now, this is going to take some setup, so wait for it. So during this time, we do some consulting work as well. And so we we're occasionally meeting with groups. And I was asked by actually a group of mice to come deal with their problem, because pretty obviously, mice have always had a little love affair with cheese, and some could say even addiction. And of course, mice were bad at things. They, they didn't really have a good grasp of the English language, and they needed help with all of these problems. And all the young mice were dying in these accidents where they would go for cheese, and they'd come up with some great ideas like wearing a helmet. But uh, the group that actually asked me to talk for them was uh, called Naturally Against Cheese Organization, which unfortunately, the acronym for that was NACHO, but they didn't see that coming. Uh, and so I, I really looked at this situation, and I thought, well, yeah, you can be wearing these helmets, and maybe you can devise a way where we can get medication to these people who are addicted to cheese. Maybe do, maybe somehow wean them down to Velveeta or something that's less addictive, because uh, nobody likes a Velveeta. But maybe what we need to do is somehow stop the cheese from coming into this, you know, into Minnesota. And we all know where it's coming from in Minnesota. It's coming from Wisconsin. And so, <laughs> really, the thought came to me, we need to we need to build a wall. And if we, because we've got cheese, we, no, this is serious now, this is really what happened. And so we've got cheese that is coming across our border every Sunday. They're coming across in droves. And they're not trying to hide it. They got it on their heads and everywhere. And so we're gonna build this wall. And in fact, we're looking into ways to make Wisconsin pay for that wall. Uh, and so really, when, when you look at this, that's a true story. It's a true story. Our problem was very similar. We didn't have too much cheese, we had too many pills. And when we looked at what was happening in our town, we had 100,000 pills coming out of three pharmacies in a city of 8,500 and a county of 30,000. Now, I was getting none of these. Heather was maybe getting a handful. And, but the reality was that that's just a lot of pills. And we were shocked by what was happening. And the task force, with all their meetings, with all their talking, was not going to solve this problem. It was the doctors and the people with the pencils in their hands that are signing these prescriptions. That's where the problem is. You need to shut off the water. You don't start mopping up before you turn the water off, and that's what we needed to do. We needed to sh shut off all the pills coming out of our clinic. So our goal really, in essence, and everybody's goal here and every community's goal, is to somehow put all these other people out of business who are making money on this by having better appropriate prescribing as a start, okay? And that's really where we go when we go everywhere, this is what we talk about. Uh, you know, because four out of five people end up on heroin, and, and our data shows that as well, is that they start with pills. And a lot of times these pills are coming right from a doctor's hand or a PA's hand, and when they get cut off on the pills, when their situation is done, their surgery, whatever, they switch, they start buying them, and then they move to heroin. And, and as Rhonda said, we did. We didn't know what we were gonna do. We, Rhonda and I, and, uh, and the nurse that we had at the time, and thank God Heather wasn't there, so it was much simpler. Uh, we sat down and we Googled this to try and find if somebody had done anything like this. And, we, we, so, and there wasn't. And so we just started making up things as we went. And we knew that we had to keep the, the refills down. We had people refilling early. No one was checking the PMP, which is a way that doctors can tell if people are doctor shopping. And we knew that we were going to have to review charts and make sure that patients were on narcotics for the right reason. 
Because isn't that part of the problem at that point is we had tons of people on narcotics who really didn't have a diagnosis that was consistent with that. Nobody would check urines, nobody would do anything else to really ensure these people were re legitimately getting these medications for a good reason. And so one of the problems, of course, um, is that uh, physicians don't like to be helped. Uh, physicians have difficulty changing. Uh, and physicians hate to have more work, right? And so now let's ask them to document better. And let's ask them to uh, do things in their charts that might be, you know, to do the right thing. Because it takes more time and, it, and, and told how to manage their patients. Doctors just love that when you go into their office and say, here's what I'd like you to do. It's going to take you more time and it's going to be really annoy you. So get, get at it. And they don't. And so what we wanted to do was help them do that with this team, help them do these things that needed to be done. And we're, most of the physicians, I think, were pretty much on board with this, but then you have some that are not, and this is difficult. And that's why uh, somebody like me had to go into their office and have the, the difficult conversations. Uh, Heather tried hugging. We tried that first. She'd hug the physicians. It never worked. And so I'd have to go in and have a real serious talk with them. And those are not the fun times in our clinic. People didn't want to see me at their door. One of the things that uh, happened then was uh, we changed a little bit what, what we were doing. We added people, and I think we, one thing we did was add a social worker, which at the time I thought was potentially the dumbest thing that Rhonda had come up with. I think you came up with that. Because uh, I thought, what are we going to do? This is a police action. We're, we're taking away all these pills. But the reality is the social worker was the best part of this program. Because these are people who have addiction issues. These are people who have housing issues, legal issues, all kinds of problems that we need to figure out if we're going to get them help when they're off their pills or off their heroin. So really important. And then, of course, we added something called a patient-centered medical home, which at the time I had no idea what that was. I thought they were turning our clinic into a nursing home. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, that was Dr. Bell. She is a patient-centered medical home. And she actually considered herself my upgrade. I looked at this the first time and I thought, I'm number one, she's number two. Uh, but apparently it means something different. So what we did then was we started, we started with the list. We took our EMR, we figured out how many patients do we have on these medications? How many patients do we have on benzodiazepines? And we made this list based on the fact that these patients had uh, about three months of medications. And initially we only looked at narcotics. We weren't looking at the other stimulants and the benzodiazepines, although we added those later. Uh, and one of the big things that we would do is we'd have patients come in and we'd, they'd, have, they'd meet with our nurse and our social worker. They would sign a care plan, not a pain plan. We, we do care plans because we care, right? Uh, and then part of what's in the care plan is we're going to check your urine and we're going to make sure that the correct things are in your urine. And this is a standard of care now, okay? Uh, you'd be surprised what you see in people's urines, even Red Hots occasionally trying to throw you off. Uh, but just about anything could be in there. And many times we would actually watch these. Our social worker and our nurse would look through all these different things as we would get information from patients. And you'd be so surprised where you find information that tells you this patient is not appropriate for the medications they're getting. And, and I would tell you drug-related, the Department of Corrections is one of those places sometimes in patients that we're concerned about that we'll find out they had previously sold pills, they'd previously been arrested for that. I mean, these are patients that are not really appropriate. But we get all this information so that when we make decisions on patients that we review their charts that we know what to do. And of course, then we needed to find a kind of a way to kind of go through this. Dr. Bell and I can't do this all ourselves. And so we have nurse, a nurse and a social worker who basically fill out a form for us with all the things that we think are important for this patient's care. And then we sit down in our meetings and we this is an actual meeting. Actually, they took our program, they made a TV pilot for it, and they, they actually had Dr. McDreamy pay me, or play me, which I thought was pretty humbling. Uh, I don't think Heather's, oh no, she is at that meeting. She's at the end of the table. But we would sit at this table every week and we'd decide who needs medications, and we would, Dr. Bell and I review their x-rays, their physical therapy, the, all of the referrals they've had, and then make recommendations to our doctors as to what we felt needed to be done. Uh, and again, initially, uh, some of these things were not well met. Uh, some of the physicians really didn't want to hear from us. That's changed a lot, and we'll talk about that a little bit later why. Uh, but a lot of times we would, we, we would recommend that people get dose reductions. Maybe they need physical therapy. Maybe, maybe they need to be reevaluated and get a, an MRI scan that they haven't had in 20 years. Okay? Some of these people need to be reevaluated so we can make a decision. So it's really important. So lots of different things that we could come up with. Uh, obviously, if we find out the patient's selling our medication, that is a different problem. And depending on why they're diverting them, that's also something that we want to know. And, uh, you know, I think that as we look at that, um, when we've had people diverting, they've been really from age 20 all the way to 70, 
We've had, we've had little old ladies who are making cakes for their doctor every month and getting their pills and selling them in our clinic. Now, to be clear, our program is not punitive. We don't dismiss these patients from our clinic. We sit down with those patients and find out what's going on. Because if we dismiss them from our clinic, they're going to go to another clinic, and then it's somebody else's problem. So it's really important that you understand that no matter what the reason that they, we're stopping their narcotics or tapering them, we still want to have a good idea where they're at and how we can help. Uh, we do have priority patients. We get calls from our police all the time. Uh, we got one, uh, we got, one of our communities actually called us this morning that we work with, and uh, they have one of their people that got arrested for selling their medications. We get that kind of, that kind of information all the time. These, this is information that you cannot act on. This is information that you use to really look at patients much more closely. I can't get information from police that somebody's selling it without proof and just dismiss them you, or stop their meds. We have to do our due diligence to make sure that those medications do or do not need to be removed. One of the hardest parts of our job is getting physicians to change the way they think. Really hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, Physicians change slow, and that was, that was actually something that was taped to one of my patient's legs who was trying to avoid my urine test, and we see this with relative frequency. And, and changing how physicians think sometimes takes, unfortunately, bad things. We've had overdose deaths of patients getting medications from our clinic. Uh, we've had police information, all these different things that then you go into the doctor and say, I'm sorry to tell you this, but one of your patients just got caught selling your pills. That makes them a little bit more careful down the road. And so that's a really important thing. And we do this really because in Minnesota and all the different states now, our state board is way different than it was in 2007 where they were telling us to prescribe medications. Now they're telling us that if you are prescribing these medications, you have to do all of these things to carefully make sure that the patient is, is a person that should be on medications and that everything else about them uh, is closely monitored and documented. Very important. Uh, Dr. Bell actually reviewed a case for the State Board a couple of years ago, and honestly, it can be pretty uh, disgusting, some of the things that are going on at some of these pill mills. It really is pretty amazing. So what has happened in our, in our community? Uh, really, one of the interesting things is that our, our emergency room is not so busy anymore with this kind of problem. It's, it's in the bottom half of, or way at the bottom of our, our list of why patients come to our ER. No one comes to our ER expecting that they're going to get narcotics. That just does not happen. In fact, we've uh, tapered uh, 633 patients out of our clinic uh, who are on benzodiazepines or opioids. And in fact, uh, if you look at the, the pill count, it's actually over 700,000 now. So we have 700,000 less pills per year coming out of our clinic uh, since we have started this program, which I really think is, uh, has been quite amazing. Uh, and that's really what caught the attention of what some of the people at the state level, which is why we do other things for them now. Uh, and it's about 55,000 units per month. And again, we had about 100,000 going out before. Now we've cut about 55,000 out of that. One of the important things to remember is that if you're taking care of these patients, you expect that you're going to be doing referrals. You're sending these people to other things. And a lot of physical therapy, social services involved with these patients. We have a social worker right in our clinic who helps them get all that arranged. Uh, you know, a lot of you are business people, and so... You know, I can, I can just use the usual terms of, you know, we all kind of talk the same language when it comes to numbers. Uh, you, you can see the lighter brown is where we started, and the darker brown is where we are now, and it's just less pills. It's real complicated. Less pills. These are Schedule II. Those are the, this is a, Heather wanted me to say this is a downward regression line, whatever. The pills are going down right? This is the medications that are the narcotics, the Vicodins, the oxycodones. This is what's happened in the last few years at our clinic. Uh, same thing here. This is things like benzodiazepines, Ativan, Valium, all those kinds of things. Uh, the, the dark is the, where we are now. The lighter one that's tall, that's where we were. It's less pills coming out of our clinic, and that's the way it needs to be. Again, line going down. Our pharmacies are putting less pills out in our community. Uh, hopefully, we will make less people addicted, because that's really got to be the key. And so we taper people for all these different reasons. And again, I would tell you that one third of the patients or more that we reviewed charts on, we couldn't figure out why they were on pain pills in our clinic. Couldn't figure out what reason they were on. And you'd have to ask them, and I don't think even their doctor knew. And again, at the bottom, I talk a little bit about uh, not dismissing these patients. That's not our goal. Uh, it's not our goal at all. So I'm going to let Dr. Bell take over. She's going to talk about some of the different things that we do in our clinic and then some of our state programs that we've been doing here this last uh, couple of years here, or year. All right. So in full disclosure, he lied. In 1986, I was not 16. I was like four. 
<laughs> he likes to say we went to med school together, just a, you know, a couple years apart, and I like to point out it was a couple decades apart. So there you know. So here is our team, and this, this is kind of the whole crux of this, is, is we have a whole team that surrounds these patients. So Kurt's talked about what, what we did with all the chronic opioid prescribing. Now I'm going to kind of flip it forward and say, what do you do with patients who are actually addicted or who have opioid use disorder, who have become addicted to their pills? So what medication-assisted treatment is, is is taking the medication to treat a person's uh, use disorder rather than abstinence-based. You think of abstinence-based treatment programs, just quit it, quit the drug, quit drinking alcohol, quit whatever, and move on. It just doesn't work like that with opioid use disorder. The brain chemistry actually changes in that it can't function without those opioids there. So without MAT, the, the chance of relapse is just super duper high. There are three types of medication-assisted treatment. There's agonist types, so the type that acts just like your heroin, just like the oxy, that's your methadone. There's the antagonist that so blocks all those receptors. This is your Vivitrol if you're looking at name brands. There's issues with that. I'm not going to get into all this. And then there's Suboxone, which is the form that we use. Lucky for us, we have MAT because if you look back at the cat, you know, you can't do cheese-assisted therapy even with Velveeta because the acronym for cheese-assisted therapy is actually CAT. Probably not going to help keep, you know, lower the risk of mice dying if you use cheese-assisted therapy. So what do we use? Buprenorphine naloxone, the brand name Suboxone, is a partial agonist. So it partially binds to those receptors in the brain where things like heroin binds. It's safe though, so it partially binds, but you can't get high. You can't keep taking more and more and more and get high. There's a ceiling effect. It's easy to take once or twice a day med medications, and a primary, ooh, sorry, a primary care doctor can actually prescribe it. Methadone, you have to go to a methadone clinic. Um, you know, who knows where they are in your state. Um, this can be done in a primary care clinic. This is what it looks like. These are really complicated pictures. The left one just shows how oxy, how heroin, how methadone, how it all binds. You get that full, perfect fit, euphoria, relaxation, analgesic effect. On the right is how Suboxone binds. Kind of partially binds, so it doesn't get that same effect, yet it helps the brain function. Now, you'll never forget this after my neat new analogy. Patrick Swayze, Dirty Dancing. He is your heroine. He is your methadone. He, he is in that movie, and you don't, I mean, you watch Dirty Dancing with him in there, and he is a perfect fit for this movie, right? You get that euphoric effect. He just fits this movie perfectly. Now, you could put somebody else in his role, probably not going to have the same effect. <laughs> Kurt is our Suboxone, so he could do the role. I don't know if he's strong enough to lift people above his head, but he could do the role. You're just not going to quite get that same euphoria from Kurt in the role. But, but if, this, if this is really how we're supposed to treat opioid use disorder, why, why don't people, people get treatment? Part of the problem is when we started treating opioid use disorder a few years ago, there were like 10 rural doctors who could prescribe and maybe two that were actually prescribing in the entire state of Minnesota. We were then two more. Everywhere else, they had to drive to the Twin Cities multiple hours to get treatment. And doctors have limits. You can only see so many patients at a time, and you can only prescribe so many, so many doses of Suboxone at a time. And of course, there's stigma associated with it. You go stand outside a methadone clinic, everyone knows why you're there. You go to my clinic, no one knows why you're there. You sit in my waiting room in our rural primary care clinic next to my pregnant people, next to my elderly, next to my well childs, and you're just in, in a clinic like everybody else, which is why we really, really encourage all rural clinics to do this. People exist in every community with opioid use disorder. You just have to actually go look for it. And it actually is currently the standard of care. This is how you are supposed to treat people with opioid use disorder. Because if you look at just behavioral intervention, so just the abstinence base, 80% of people are going to relapse within two years if you just change their behaviors. If you look at methadone, buprenorphine, you look at the, the MAT, 60% stay in treatment within a couple of years. One study that was done not that long ago showed 75% people retained into program if they were given buprenorphine versus zero people retained in treatment who got nothing, who got placebo, who got the behavioral intervention, plus four people in that arm died. But why else do we do this? 
problem sometimes with clinics like methadone clinics is that you have to go there every day or every other day. Travel across your state to get your methadone for the day, go home. You can't hold a job. You can't be a participating member of society. Our patients work. If you look at this graph, 70% of our patients are either working or they're retired. 30%, they're in treatment. They're figuring it out still. Because they, by the time they're doing well, I only see them every couple of months. I don't have to see them all the time. At the beginning, I do. But after a while, I don't. Some of our patients actually have multiple jobs, much like my, my partner here, Kurt. He has multiple jobs besides this. It's, it, his second job is something he's a little bit always afraid to show people, a little shy about. Um, you know, we're in Vegas, so we thought I'd, I'd kind of show his other side. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> super funny, Katie. Um, so decreasing opioid use. So, when you look at the criminal justice system and you actually start to look at patients who are on MAT in society, communities that have thriving MAT programs actually have fewer arrests. People are not going to jail. And those who get treatment while they're in jail are much more likely to maintain their sobriety and not get rearrested. So this is a huge gap in society right now with getting treatment. And this is my absolute probably favorite slide, even though it doesn't make fun of Kurt. Is, is pregnancy. So this is Ashley. I've got permission to use names. This is Ashley. She was one of our Suboxone patients who got pregnant. And this is baby Jada, who just turned one. Ashley was pregnant with Jada on Suboxone her entire pregnancy. She came into her prenatal appointments, just like I did when I was pregnant. So pa patients who are on MAT actually get prenatal care versus people who are on heroin, they tend to not get prenatal care. Jada got did awesome. She delivered and stayed in the hospital, never had to get any kind of medications, never had any neonatal abstinence. She just did perfectly. They went home and just lived a normal life just like I do with all my kids. The one thing missing from this picture that you all can't see is child protection. Child protection did not get involved with this mom and baby. They did not visit them at their home. This baby did not go to foster care. This baby got to go home with her mom and her dad and her big sister like any other family. So that is why this is super important to do in rural communities as well, because we deliver babies in rural communities. So now how do you get into our program? Anybody can do it. This team program, even our you know, scarecrow with all the brain can handle doing MAT rurally. So what happens is a patient calls our clinic, talks to our nurse, talks to our social worker. We get a full history. Um, we've kind of changed our workflow a little bit. Basically, a patient calls and says, hey, I want help. We see them right now. If they're, if they're in withdrawal and they say, I need help right now, you see them. Because otherwise, they're going to get their meds, they're going to get their drugs, and you're going to lose them. And they might die. And so the next dose of heroin could kill that person. So when someone calls for help, you bring them into the clinic. Once they're in the clinic, our entire team surrounds them. We help them get insurance. We help them with their housing. We help them kind of navigate treatment. We help them rebuild their bridges with their families, everything that they've broken down. We are their support system. And, and we want them to feel that way. We want them to feel comfortable with us. We don't want to fire them. Like Kurt said, we're not a punitive program. They're not perfect. I mean, we have 49 inactive patients. Some of them are in prison. I'm not going to lie. Um, but for the most part, our patients had a heroin patient call with heroin in her hand, going, I don't want to use this. What do I do? And she was comfortable enough to call our team to kind of talk her out of that. So these are our numbers. These are old. We have a little over 80, 85, I think, now active patients in our clinic. Um, but this is why we do this. The further away in sobriety a person is, the better that they do. First three months, the brain has to reheal to adult. And then after that, Suboxone sometimes is a lifelong or a long-term medication. And it's okay because they have jobs, they have families, they have totally normal lives. Patients are good with that. But the real reason to do MAT in all reality is it saves lives. That's Kurt, everybody. Um, so th we've had a few, uh, you know, I, I kind of alluded to it. There's a couple breaks in the health healthcare system or in treating little gaps in, in care for patients with opioid use disorder, and one really surrounds the jail. So what happened? Why did we care about the jail? Because whenever we've been doing something in our program and we saw there was a problem, we decided to fix it, and the jail was one of them. One of my patients got arrested. He had to go back to jail for something he did uh, two years ago, and he had been doing super well on his Suboxone. You go to jail, you lose your insurance, you lose your non-necessary medication, so they stopped his Suboxone, 
And when he got out of jail, he ended up relapsing and getting picked right back up for possession on his way to my appointment. So we have lost him. So really trying to show the county that if we can keep patients on their medications if they're stable, the chance of them doing well, continuing to do well, is higher. So in our county, if you're on Suboxone and you go to jail, you get to keep your Suboxone because the, the cost of Suboxone for a day is $8. The cost of jail is $120. So we don't want that revolving door. So we, what we did, we got together any single person in our county or community that has anything to do with our jail. We got the judge, we got the doctor, we got social services. We got everybody involved and said, this is what we're going to do. So now we actually also, as opposed to continuing to jump on this revolving door cycle of jail, what happens in our jail now, a patient gets arrested, they start to withdraw. And if you've never seen heroin withdrawal, um, I don't recommend it. It's awful. It looks like the worst influenza meets the worst stomach flu all in one person extreme. So when a person's in jail and they're in withdrawal, they're in one-to-one -one babysitting with the, with the jail nurse because they are vomiting everywhere, they're having diarrhea everywhere, and they are sick. And it's like five days of process until they finally feel semi-normal. Why not give that patient Suboxone when they start getting sick and within an hour they are feeling normal, they can go back to general population and therefore that nurse is not having to do that one-on-one -on -one babysitting. Plus, it's much more humane. So patients now in our county, um, first county jail in the country, they get Suboxone when they get arrested if they want treatment. And then when they get out of jail, they come right back to our program to keep them out of jail. So the jail numbers, because you guys like data. First 44 patients, and we are constantly getting data on all of our patients. First 44 patients that we started, we asked them, how many days have you spent in jail in the last three years? They averaged 28 days in jail, each of these 44 people. We asked them the same question, how many days have you spent after you started on Suboxone? They averaged 0 .08 days in jail. I think it was one jail day for all these 44 people. I mean, that's, those are stunning numbers. And why aren't they in jail? Because they're working, they're, they're retired, they're stay-at-home moms. Can't argue. Another gap that we saw in our, in our community was in our emergency room. You know, emergency rooms are, are clearly places where people go in emergencies, heart attacks, strokes, but why not for Suboxone? Another analogy. This is Kurt's car. This is his baby. Um, I was actually able to call Michaela this morning and change these slides um, because I got a call from Kurt's wife, Jackie, um, and she didn't want to tell Kurt this because he tends to get a little manicky before talks. And she asked, said, can you just somehow tell him that I took his car to town this morning and this is what happened? <laughs> True emergency. Are you serious? <laughs> no, that's not your car. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> his car is currently in the shop getting bumper-assisted therapy right now. <laughs> so anyway, all joking aside. But, but like he said, you know, car accidents, people are dying of opioid use disorder way more than car accidents, yet every doctor in every ER needs to have trauma life support. They need to have cardiac life support. They need to know how to treat all people. Except when you have an addict or a person with a use disorder come in, they don't want to treat these people. And you hear that all the time. They, like, want to get them in and out as quick as they can. That person's chance of dying from when the second they leave that ER is actually much higher than that stroke person or that heart attack person in the next couple of hours. So we really wanted to ca capture those patients while they're there because it's the same cycle as the jail. You know, it's a revolving door. They're in and out, they're in and out until they die. Why not get them in the ER, they want help, start them on treatment because ER docs, even if they're not wavered, can treat a patient for three days with Suboxone while they're waiting to get into a program like ours. So we have, in our community are finally getting on board with our, with our ER docs and getting our patients treated at that moment because that might be the only time these patients hit healthcare is in that emergency department when they just about died. So we really want to capture that. So that's kind of what we've done in our community. And then the really fun stuff happened. Our state said, wow, look what you did with that grant. Can you do this in the entire state? Like, you'd got Morrison County down, but what about the whole state of Minnesota? So the Minnesota Department of Health gave us some legislative grant funding a couple of years ago. It finally got started this year. It takes so long to get money from the state. So eight communities in our state, here they are, got money to basically clone what we've done. So they got to get a nurse to start monitoring. They have to monitor the prescribing, because again, you gotta shut the pills off first. They have to have at least one wavered prescriber, and they needed to have a community task force. The goal with one year of, of this funding and this program was to cut one million pills 
out of these eight communities. So far in six months, we've already cut 600,000 out of three of the communities. So this is a goal that's super easily attainable throughout any state, and these are all rural communities. Some of them are smaller than ours even. That project happens to start to overlap with our other program that is through Minnesota Department of Human Services, Project ECHO. So Project ECHO, for those of you who are not aware, is a, is a movement that kind of came out of the University of New Mexico. University of New Mexico doctor Sanjeev Aurora, who's a hepatitis C doctor, said, I can't possibly take care of every hepatitis C patient in New Mexico myself. Bottom is traditional telemedicine. Him taking care of somebody over a computer is not really getting more people into clinic because he still can only take care of one patient. So he thought, why can't me and my team of experts teach all these rural primary care doctors how to do what we do so then they can take care of their own patients? So it's this whole multiplication of force model that we have now adapted into Little Falls. So here is what our Project Echo room looks like. So our echo is a little different because, as Kurt said, we are not experts in anything. He's an expert in wood cutting. I'm an expert in taking care of lots of babies. But that's about it. We are really good at our program, though. And so we get on as rural primary care doctors, and we teach other rural primary care doctors how to do what we've done. So it's more of a peer-based learning. Um, and so we get on weekly and do this program with the whole general idea that we want people to watch the prescribing, but also start treating patients with Suboxone in their rural communities. So how does this look? It's super easy. Wednesdays we do our show at noon Minnesota time. We do attendance, we do a little teaching topic, and then we do case-based discussion where a case is presented um, and we all talk about it. Now we do have a lot of friends who are way smarter than we are, so they get on and, and play in too. And for our providers, they get free CME just for coming on. Different topics. This is going to be a lot, really coming in quick. We started in January. We have done everything from care plans to urine drug screens to kratom to starting buprenorphine in your clinic to opioid use disorder and pregnancy. And the good news is, is we are not the only presenters. People do not have to listen to us talk all the time. We have lots of specialist friends. Actually, coming up in January is Wilson. Compton, the deputy director from the National Institute of Health, is actually doing a presentation for us. Sanjeev Aurora, the developer of ECHO, is doing a presentation for us in December on hepatitis C and IV drug use. So we have a lot of fun guest speakers that come on to help teach Minnesota. What does it actually look like? Data again. So Little Falls, we're the red flag. All the green flags are the spokes that actually log on with some regularity. Yes, North Dakota's in there, and yes, we have been to Alaska. Alaska is one of our spokes right now, with this many people logging in. We have had 160 people logging in to listen to us talk. It's pretty cool. All across our state. It's super fun. But what does it actually look like? How, uh, people can log on and learn, but does that actually translate to helping people get better? So again, we are the red flag. So far in the last few months, we have already added this many new Suboxone prescribers to our state. We have added almost, well, this is old data again, 30 new Suboxone prescribers in our state in the last few months. Again, there was only two of them a few years ago. We made four, and now we have 30 new ones in just a few months. And those 30, those 30 docs are actually taking care of an additional 80 patients on Suboxone. So 80 additional people on top of our 80. We have over 160 patients in Minnesota who now don't have to travel across the state to get treatment. They can get their treatment in their normal primary care clinic. So it would be like adding 30 additional CURTs across Minnesota to treat patients with Suboxone. He likes that idea. I prefer this idea. Oh, you jerk. God! That's supposed to be me, not me when I was three. But reality, Kurt can go to Wisconsin <laughs> over his wall. Um, we, with our programs, we, we also kind of brainchild this, this other new echo that we started um, in October for our RPAP. So RPAP um, is a rural physician program that we have in Minnesota. We're at third year of medical school. Students can actually live in rural Minnesota and do a lot of their third-year rotations in primary care clinics in the rural setting. So they do ER, they do peds, they do surgery, all in that community. So they really get involved in that community. So we have about 40 of these students in our state right now. We thought, why can't we take 
what we do with ECHO and teach these students. Because you can see they cover areas similar to where we've already been, but even further. And medical students are really like motivated, eager to learn. They think they can still change the world, and they really want to. They really want to help the communities that they're in. So now we do an echo just for the students. Because right now, medical student curriculum has about two hours of opioid education. Through our echo for our RPAP students or our medical students, they're getting 800% more than that. They're getting 16 hours of opioid education. The hope that at some point they're going to become family practice residents, maybe go into addiction fellowship, maybe take Kurt's job. That's the goal. Are you going to get up for the next new echo that we are starting next year? Yeah, one of the things that we're looking at now, uh, Minnesota's doing something really pretty interesting where uh, our state is going to be coming out with what's called a opioid report card. And this is something that's been in the works for a while. And what's going to happen is every provider uh, in Minnesota, anybody that can prescribe a narcotic is going to, in January, they're going to get a sheet of paper that tells them how they compare to their peers with their prescribing. And what's going to happen with that is they will be compared, and if they fall out a certain guideline, they are going to, after the first year, they are going to be required to do CME, required to do quality improvement to get them in line with what everybody else is doing. Uh, and actually, the, uh, we, did, we had the person that was involved in making these guidelines on our ECHO uh, about two weeks ago to discuss this, and it was the, high, it was the second highest group of people on an ECHO ever in the United States. We had 160 no, in the people. World in the world. Echo. Uh, we had 160 people on our program that day to listen to this, and there were a lot of very concerned physicians and providers because now they're going to be uh, really forced to make sure that their prescribing is better. Um, so with our, with our new <coughs> ECHO, the, the hope is that starting next year when providers may have issues with their prescribing is to do an ECHO that kind of starts over set curriculum, walk through appropriate prescribing, walk through care plans, walk through urine drug screens, walk through everything that we've taught, everything that we've done in our clinic to really educate these providers um, on opioid prescribing and appropriate prescribing. Um, and then again, one of the, the caveats or one of the, the punishments, if you will, that a, a provider who gets flagged or gets you know, in trouble with their report card is they're going to probably have to do some required CME um, to kind of prove that they're learning about how to be a better prescriber. And so again, our ECHO gives them a free hour of CME, so they'll be able to do their CME from their office. Do you huh. want to talk about the Support Act? Or sure. So okay. We'll just quickly touch on the Support Act, which was a recent thing that came through the federal government. Many, many of you might be uh, yeah, interested the, in, but So go the Support ahead. Act basically was just signed at the end of October, and it's starting to put new laws and new, new boundaries around providers. Um, really having Medicaid monitor refills, watching pr medications that go to kids, um, adding some expansion to treatment for mental health, um, required use of the PMP. Some places they're trying to integrate it into the EMR, um, do some telehealth payment things that is way over my head, and then do opioid use disorder part of the screening for Medicare annual wellness. So even the seniors who come in for their annual wellness exams, everybody gets PHQ-9 depression screen, but they're going to add screening for opioid use disorder as well. Um, and then Medicare will have MAT coverage in treatment programs, because right now it's hard to get coverage to get patients into treatment. Do you wanna? Yeah, and really, you know what this is gonna do, we're hoping, is it'll expand the type of providers who also uh, can do medical assisted treatment in other communities. And they're, they're, one of the issues that has always been is the first year we were doing this, we could only do 30 patients. And although we didn't go over that to begin with, they're actually raising that because there are areas where we really need help. Um, one of the big issues we've come up with over the years is hospice. Uh, there are a lot of narcotics that are sitting around in hospice homes. And interestingly, when a patient dies, those medications become the property of the family. And that's been one of the big issues, is that a lot of those medications end up being diverted. Hospice will now be able to uh, destroy those uh, prior, the ones that aren't used. And I think that's going to be a big thing. Pharmacists always want to have a say, and pharmacists frequently in our community will call us and say they are not going to fill a, a prescription, which I think is great. Uh, I, I think they look at these prescriptions and know they shouldn't be filled. And of course, one of the things with e-prescribing now, there's, we, we block that period of time, the prescription leaves the clinic until it gets to the pharmacy where they can be changed. And now with e-prescribing uh, as part of this act, I think that's going to be a real helpful thing. So that's really that's, all we have. Go yeah. ahead. Do you want to finish up? 
my grand finale. Oh, your grand finale. No. <laughs> this is my really corny finale to keep everybody awake. So again, this is Morrison County. This is where we live. Um, and we started by just helping our county, which we just talked about how we have now expanded it to our entire state. Um, with our ultimate goal, because we don't have enough to do, um, really want to make this kind of national, because this is kind of what our country looks like right now. Everybody's buried in pills, and we want to make it look something more like this, with a more appropriate prescribing, and then more rural primary or primary care doctors doing MAT, because half of our country lives rural. So that's where people need to get their, um, their help. So any questions, there's a couple quick things here. This contact information on here, um, Katie does everything for us, um, coordinates our lives. So if you want, we wrote a, we wrote a manual a couple years ago. Um, it basically walks through everything we talked about, how to monitor prescriptions. It's got some of our, all the paperwork we use. It's got clinic policy in there. It talks about doing the Suboxone. It's all in that manual, um, so you can contact Katie. If anyone's interested in getting more information about our ECHO, contact Katie. The answer is just contact Katie. So any questions? Michaela, did we do OK? <laughs> Very well done. Thank you. <laughs> She's still got a job now, because she was on the hook if this went poorly. <laughs> any questions? Yes. I saw it there that you had, one of your subjects you talked about was marijuana, so I'm curious what your view is on medical marijuana and how it affects, you know, if that can be prescribed for pain or if you feel it's a gateway drug or what is your view on that? Next question. <laughs> uh, you know, an amazing, this is an amazing coincidence. We were uh, on the plane coming here and we get on the plane and we sit down and this guy sits down next to us and uh, we, of course, asked him what he did. And uh, he says, well, I'm the co-founder of LeafLine. Well, LeafLine is the big company in Minnesota who uh, makes medical marijuana. And uh, so we spent uh, the better part of an hour having this same discussion about marijuana, uh, which I think is something that's been uh, difficult uh, for us. Uh, to be clear, when we get, like, for instance, on urine testing and our Suboxone group are pre, you know, patients who have had opioid use disorder or heroin use disorder. Uh, we tolerate a certain amount of uh, marijuana. We, we feel very much that at this point we're trying to save lives and the marijuana is not going to kill anybody. Uh, when it comes to pain and those things, go ahead, Heather, I'll let you touch this one. Of course. So if it's a patient who is, gets medical marijuana for their pain or they're on medical marijuana for that or that's what they're wanting, because in Minnesota medical marijuana is legal. Um, they, they can't be on both. Like, if you're going to be on medical marijuana for pain, then you don't need your opioids. So we're going to taper that down. Um, what we found in our clinic, and this is it's still new in Minnesota, is that most people aren't getting that same pain relief from the medical marijuana that they did from their opioids, because we don't just cut everybody's opioids off. If you have real reason to have pain meds, you get to keep them at safe doses. But as far as the gateway drug thing, um, when, we, when we first see our Suboxone patients especially, we get a full drug history. I mean, every drug known to man is on there and we ask about it. They all started with marijuana and alcohol at bizarrely young ages in some cases. And so, is it a true gateway drug? It's, it's, we were gonna do a talk on this, but it's so controversial to even do research on. There's no data on it. Um, but anecdotally, most of our patients started with it. And the problem is, is the marijuana dealer has everything else. They have meth, they have heroin, they have pills, they have all that other stuff. So heading down that rabbit hole um, is kind of what led some people to, to end up in our opioid use disorder program. I'm not sure that was really an answer. But yeah, it is a tough, it's a really Sounded tough, uh, tough thing. I mean, we, we struggle with this and we certainly know that there's particular kinds of pain that are actually, uh, you know, medical marijuana is more helpful for than others. And so uh, on our ECHO, we frequently come up against that and, and discuss that. So uh, it's, I think it's something that's going to be, over time, is going to be played out a little bit better as there's more research and there's more, um, more patients involved in that research. So, yeah, tough question, though. Yeah, anything else anybody has questions about? Otherwise, we'll let you take a break. I have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, no, next. <laughs> uh, I seem to recall that you had mentioned uh, children or, or kids bef in their teen years um, who have an accident or something, break a leg, 
uh, are much more likely to become addicted if they're prescribed opioids? Yeah, so there is a statistic, and it's been studied, that if a child, before they graduate from high school, gets a pain prescription and uses it appropriately, so they get it from the doc after their wisdom teeth or a surgery, and they take it like the doc said, they still have a, thir it's a third, 33% 33. 33 chance of become, having issues with opioids later in life. So that's used appropriately. They still have a third chance of having issues later in life. So these are not benign medications, especially in that adolescent age where the brain is still developing. Yeah, it's frankly pretty scary how many patients are in our, our program who started uh, by getting medications for their wisdom teeth or an orthopedic injury when they were 16, 17, or 18. And, and so really the exposure to narcotics at those ages should be really brief uh, because again, a third of those kids, even if they take it the right way, you know, we're gonna see those kids down the road with opioid use disorder. So it's really something to think about as a parent and a grandparent. So my question is, as a mother of a 16-year-old boy and a 13-year-old boy, God forbid something would happen, what is your advice for, for pain meds? So what I tell my patients and myself, because my kids are a little younger than yours, but I have four of them, is, is really it, monitor it. You know, if it's something like tonsils, they probably don't need the opioids. There's other ways. So try to find non-opioid methods first and then have the parents hold that script, have it really be some, a conversation you talk about beforehand. I've had a lot of adolescents who, if you have this conversation before their surgery, they're a lot more cautious themselves to even take that beyond you know, a couple of days. So really limiting those scripts um, and, and talk about it ahead of the surgery. Is it on? Any others? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, because this is the first time, I'm not a doctor, but um, this is the first time I've heard of the Suboxone, is that what you yes. call it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and well, it sounds like it's a much better treatment than methadone, but yet there's methadone clinics everywhere, and it seems like that's more of the standard. So I'm just curious. Yeah, you know, for us, methadone uh, just doesn't seem like the right idea. You know, methadone acts exactly like heroin exactly like oxycodone. Now, to be clear, the data on how well people do as far as outcome and uh, staying sober, if you will, is as good as Suboxone. But I would tell you the issue with it is, can this person have a normal life? Can this person ha can hold down a job? Can they do the things that they need to do on methadone that they, that they you know, that they want to do. And, and our experience has been in methadone patients that have come to us and wanted to switch to Suboxone or buprenorphine is the other name for it, uh, is when they get off it, they feel like they're so much less drowsy, they're so much more motivated, they get jobs, they get back to their life. And uh, you know, for us, methadone is, is frankly uh, just not the way. I, you know, I hate to say it, and we have friends who do methadone, addiction doctors who do methadone uh, prescribing, and we struggle with it. It's, you know, it, it was developed first, obviously, and it was a, a really quick answer to something at one point. And I think the problem is, is right now, which is access. You know, there isn't enough primary care doing Suboxone or doing these treatments. And so it's better than nothing in some cases. Yeah. Um, we just tend to find our patients prefer it and, uh, and to be off of methadone. Yeah, kind of an interesting fact is that when heroin was actually uh, first starting to come out, they considered using heroin to treat morphine addicts that had come out of the Civil War and out of the wars that were, had injuries. And so, I mean, this has been done before. I mean, they were gonna use heroin to help the morphine addicts, then what are you gonna do to get people off heroin? I mean, we just keep doing this, and now we're, well, now we're at methadone. Uh, Suboxone, because it's a partial agus, because it doesn't make you high, because it doesn't make you so sleepy, and you don't have to go somewhere to get it, you can go to her uh, to get it in a small town, we just see that as a much better plan. This is a problem that is, that is not gonna be solved by putting a, addiction people all over the big cities. This is a problem that has to be done by primary care because unless it's in every clinic, there should be somebody like us in every single clinic. And that's when we're gonna solve this problem. I have a question. Yes. Um, yep. I'm wondering if you have had any challenges working with insurance companies uh -huh. or drug treatment um, facilities because I know that they expect you to not have any drugs, period, and they don't 
pay for a stay if you're going to use Suboxone, and I know it is very successful, but I'm wondering how you can get the insurance companies to understand that and maybe get the laws changed around that. So, so initially when we started doing Suboxone, the first issue we had was just getting the meds to the patients even as an outpatient. You know, they have three-day prior off time. We would just get the name of the person on the phone and say, when the person dies in the next three days waiting, who can we call? And we'd get the meds right away. So we kind of bullied our way through that. As, <laughs> as far as treatment, our big goal with our patients is we get them, get them on their Suboxone and get them healthy and clean right now. We do work towards treatment. Some insurances, they have to go to treatment. We pick the treatment facilities in our state that will take Suboxone. We have a list of our favorites, whether you're a mom, whether you're a male, whether you're female, whatever. Um, we, we specifically pick programs. But our goal is to get them off of their heroin and get them healthy, and we'll get to treatment eventually. So a lot of times what happens is we get them doing so well, they get their Rule 25, their chemical use assessment, they don't even qualify for inpatient anymore. They only have to do outpatient because they've been doing so well with our program. So we've saved a lot of treatment beds and treatment stays too. To be clear, the interesting thing is, and we mentioned this before, is that without Suboxone, your chance of relapse is super high. Now, interestingly, if you're on Suboxone alone, alone, and we have these patients who never went to treatment because their insurance doesn't require it, medical assistance will require it, typically. There are a lot of studies that show that just Suboxone and a supportive team is almost as good as going inpatient. And so I think that the paradigm is going to change a little bit over time if you have teams of people taking care of these, these clients. So. Yeah. been a heroin addict have to stay on that the rest of their lives if they so chose. So, yeah. Go ahead. You can. Well, the thing with Suboxone is do, if you're on Suboxone long term, and I can't believe nobody's asked. Everybody says, well, how long are you on Suboxone? Okay. And the, the studies show that if you're on it for less than five years, your chance of relapse is 86%. Okay. And so do you kind of get addicted to the Suboxone in that you'll withdraw from it? Uh, yes, you will withdraw from it if you take that, and it's a pretty long, prolonged thing. But what we do over time as we get to that five, six, seven years is we slowly taper it. And so our goal is at some point these patients will slowly be tapered off. Not all will be off completely, but hopefully some of them will. Interesting, there's a, there's, they're all different because if you have people taking pills as opposed to snorting heroin as opposed to IVing heroin, those patients act very different on Suboxone and, and we know that. And so we, they, the dosing that they take and how long they need to be on can be very different. Now, the biochemistry of how it affects the brain and how the brain heals and gets back its normal chemicals, not everybody's comes back. So some people just need that long-term medication, um, but it's not like the same as like an addiction to it. Are you kicking us off? No, we got five minutes. We have five minutes. Any other questions? <laughs> She's got a question. My question is just kind of a continuation of Michaela's is, um, you're already doing so much, which is awesome, but have you thought of going into the schools to do education to catch it before it actually comes to head? So Funny you should ask. We, we do. We actually, they, they laugh at us because we had like 140 slides you all just had to watch, um, and so we had to cut something. No. Um, we do. One of our patients who's been um, on Suboxone for about a year and a half, she and I go to the high schools near us. And we do high school forums um, for, we've done seventh grade through senior year, we do forums in the schools for that. Um, there's a new program in Minnesota, a mom who lost her child to a heroin overdose, who, who goes into schools as well and does programming. Um, and we've worked with her, she made a video that they show in the schools that we're in. And, and so, yes, we mostly do address- Mostly Heather. Mostly me, yeah. but <laughs> I'm more relatable to high schoolers. Yeah. <laughs> She's the eye candy. I was just like in the background. <laughs> no, so we do. We do. That's yes. The long answer is yes. We do go into schools and do prevention things too. And we have flyers. We have a number that rings to our, all, all of our nurses, our social worker. We have flyers that say if you need help, it explains addiction. They are hanging in all the bars in our town. They're at all the pharmacies. They're everywhere. And so we have people who will pick the flyer up. Oh, I was in so and so bar and I saw your flyer and they call us. So we, we really try to get out there and do what we can. Yeah, I think it's interesting. One other point I want to make before we stop, but these patients become some of our favorite patients. Uh, I delivered babies for almost 20 years, and, I, and that's, a, that's a very interesting bond that you have with patients that you delivered. She's been delivering babies now. I stopped. 
um, I actually take care of three of my patients that I delivered and their children who are heroin addicted patients, right? So it's come kind of full, full circle for me. These are kids that I've known since they were born. But these patients become some of our favorite patients and, and it might be interesting that sometimes when we get a patient that's coming in that's sick, we'll almost argue over who gets to take them because we, we consider this an important part of our day and it's fun. Uh, this is a fun part of our job and when we go to communities, we try and explain to them how this is such a, a satisfying part of what we do when you see people rebuild their lives and rebuild their families. And so I think that's the, the message if you take one thing home is that, that, that these patients do well and they change and they get good jobs. Uh, and we have many who had good jobs uh, and prior and lost everything. So we, and it's we, an important you know, group. Sometimes we hear that they don't want these people in their clinic. Like I said, you would never know if you came to our clinic who was on Suboxone and who wasn't. Um, it's actually a super joy. These are grateful people. They thank everybody for, for being there for them. They thank the pharmacy every time. They thank my LPN. They thank our nurse. They thank everybody for being there to help them get, get clean and sober and off of their drugs. I can tell one quick story. No. Can I tell one are quick story? Are there any other questions? Yes, right here. You said I'm done. She has a question. One the national what? National yeah. Governors Conference. Because the governors make, I'm sorry, sorry. I just, I know that Congress has some challenges the next two years in yeah. getting much done, but the National Governors Conference, I watch tapes of their talks yeah. um, while I work out. It takes me yeah. about a month to get through them. But it's <laughs> a great forum for your program because yeah. a lot of governors could push within their states to do something now and it wouldn't be delayed for two years. Yeah. So and, you we'll know, we, take that and make it a pop bet. We like to bet on pop and soda. And that's how we got this whole program going was over a bet. But no, I, we never even heard of that. We have been to DC and we've done a couple um, congressional like hearings, briefings um, with the staffers, but I, yeah, we've not. Yeah, with Amy Klobuchar and then uh, he's well, not there anymore. Al Franken. <laughs> yeah, and then that went south. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, but it's hard to get traction out there. It really is to get people to listen and to do something bigger. It is really hard. Yeah, so. We just got a new governor. We have to meet him yet. He's given us the, he hit the hook here. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank, thank you. you. We're going to start much. the Academy more music yeah. here in just a minute. <laughs>